beautiful special music this morning by our ladies group and our ladies here as well. And uh, we appreciate your ministering to us in uh, music this morning together. I'm, I'm certain uh, we've all been blessed by it. And it just helps us prepare as we uh, want to look in the Word of God and want to be challenged by it in our own lives also. So if you are glad to be here this morning, say amen. amen. Boy, I sure hope you are. The Lord is blessed. The Lord has given us so much uh, to be thankful for. We are, or we ought to be, uh, thankful people uh, each and every day. Take your Bibles if you would. Uh, many of you know where we're headed this morning. Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to approach this just a little bit different today uh, than we normally would. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, state our, our conclusion, and, and that is that we are fully forgiven in Jesus Christ. Listen, we are fully forgiven. And I believe uh, when we get to the end of this chapter, or we're looking at the first 18 verses today, but we'll, we'll, we get to our conclusion, uh, we will see that very thing laid out as we proceed here together uh, this morning. So I want to dig right in here to the scriptures. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, we're going to be reading in verse uh, 1 and then down through verse 18. So if if you're following along, uh, follow with me. Paul says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Therefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he saith, when, uh, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hath pleasure therein which is offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Look at verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering, offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, this Jesus Christ, verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever him that sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. We are fully forgiven in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this day, a day to gather, a day to worship, a day to reflect, Lord, a day to open and study and meditate upon your word. Lord, I, I pray today as we look at this simple principle, we've looked at it many times. We've seen this book leading up to really this conclusion this morning. That God, through we, we can be fully forgiven. 
through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's all of what he has done through his death, his burial, his resurrection. And then, God, I pray if there's one today that has never entered into that relationship, oh, Lord, that they would call upon your son to save them today. Their sins could be forgiven. They could know what being fully forgiven is all about in their life. And then, Lord, for those of us this morning that hold on to this truth, God, I pray as we see in these scriptures, we're going to learn some thoughts, some insights then, Lord, as to how you really expect us to live, how this should spur us on, Lord, to seek, to seek Christ's likeness in our life. Lord, bless all that we do in, this, in these next few minutes together. Work in our hearts. Lord, move us, convict us, encourage us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, this chapter marks uh, really the end of Paul's primary thought. He's been building up to really this point here in this scripture about Jesus Christ. We've been provided with evidence uh, that the new covenant in Jesus Christ is superior to the old. We've spent uh, quite a bit of time on that. Paul has already emphasized repeatedly, uh, Pastor Lane mentioned it even in Sunday school, how Jesus is superior to everything. We went through this time and time again. Paul has methodically worked his way through these principles up to this point in scripture, right? We've seen how God had always intended to replace those temple sacrifices. Their purpose were to be symbolic. They were a shadow of what was to come. And what was to come was a permanent solution to sin Amen. through Jesus Christ, right? That's what all of this was about. This first half, rather this first half of this chapter, Paul completes really this exhaustive argument, right? From chapter one, now through verse 18, he, he, he is completing this, this picture that he has woven together time and time again. And as he has done before, he, he throws in one last point of really logical conclusion. That's why I like Paul. He just, he, he's, he's a logical guy, right? He thinks with that sort of logical mindset. And that, that last conclusion is if the offering of the old covenant, if those offerings, those sacrifices could remove the penalty for sin, if they could abolish that penalty for sin, the conclusion is there would be no need to offer them again and again and again, right? It's just common sense. Instead, they couldn't. They had to be repeated. They had to be repeated over and over. And then Paul points to the real purpose of that old covenant, of that sacrificial system. It was a reminder of sin, not a removal of it. It was a reminder of what was to come, that perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ then would bring with his life. And that's what he's laying out in these verses for us today. He also references there, you saw in that scripture, it maybe sounded a little, bit, a little bit redundant to you, right? Where he talks about that body, uh, with that verse five and six and seven, offerings and sacrifice or sins, hast I no pleasure in? Then said I, lo, I come to do thy will, O Lord. That's repeated in the next following verses. He's referring there to the Old Testament, right? That's taken from Psalm Psalm uh, chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. And what he is doing is he is showing that God's intent was for his will to be completed through, through a body. Excuse me. Through a body. Rather than, in contrast to, those daily sacrifices of bulls and goats and birds and all of those things. This reference, right, from Psalms points us prophetically to Jesus Christ. That's what we're learning there in that Psalm 40, verse 6 through 8. And it's pointing to him prophetically as one who fulfilled every scripture that identified him as God's obedient servant. And it's 
also pointing to him prophetically as the Savior. Jesus' life from conception to crucifixion to resurrection was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. He was the prophet, he was the prophesied Messiah. He was obedient to God's will in all things, including including his sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He went to the cross out of love for us, out of obedience to his father. This was possible. Why was that different? Just to remind you one more time, why was this sacrifice different from all those bulls and goats and all that other blood that was offered? It's different because Jesus' sacrifice is perfect. It's a once and for all event. That body was prepared and it lived a sinless, perfect life. Therefore, it only needed to be offered once for you and me. One's been quoted saying, once the ultimate solution has been offered, there is no reason to bring that same sacrifice over again. And when Jesus Christ gave his life and shed his blood, that was it. There needed nothing else to be offered. That ultimate solution had been taken care of. Now, Paul, as he's sort of drawing this conclusion over and over again, right? He's pointing to the sufficiency. He's pointing to the supremacy of Christ. He again is reiterating just the fulfillment of the gospel, how it can change someone, how it's a one-time event offering sacrifice, how the blood of Jesus Christ truly has the power to cleanse and forgive sin, right? We'll see in a few minutes, it, it wipes our slate clean. When people hear this news, when people hear this instruction, when people hear this, these scriptures, uh, they, they tend to interpret them in different ways, right? I just sort of wanted to break this down quickly this morning. There's about three main responses people will have when they just sort of heard what we went over already this morning, right? There are those that hear this they understand that Jesus, what he did. They believe he died. They believe he shed his blood. They, they believe he rose again, but they still won't fully accept it. We, we spent a lot of time on this last week. I'm not going to this morning, but I do want to hit this one more time. What they do then is they continue to believe their good work will sort of balance out all the bad or sin in their life. Right, so, so there's still every time they read the Bible, every time they go to church, they come away thinking the same thing. They believe they must try just a little harder to gain salvation. Yes, I believe in what Jesus did, but I must contribute something. And friend, listen, Jesus Christ's sacrifice is all you need for salvation. Just rest in it today. Trust in it today. We said last week, even by us thinking that we could have something to offer that's equivalent or greater than Christ's sacrifice, boy, isn't that just even disgracing the very sacrifice? Put your faith in him. There's a second group. There will be those who see all their failures. Maybe they see their sin. They see sort of what God requires, and they just tend to give up. They figure, you know what, there's no use in going to church. There's no use in reading the Bible. There's really no use in trying to live by God's standard. It just seems too hard for them. So what are they determined to do? They just determine then to go out and live for the moment. Right, That whole mentality, live however I want to live, do whatever I want to do. They grab whatever they can, whatever they can. Their life revolves around really just that sort of immediate gratification. And folks, even in this, this is reliance on self instead of Christ, instead of trusting in what God's, God has accomplished through his son, instead of receiving that free gift. Then there's another group. And I would contribute today that most of us are fall into this last group. There are those who receive the gospel. Right? They believe, they understand that they, what our topic is today, that they are fully forgiven. 
And then that gospel to them is good news because it means that Jesus paid for their sin and they grasp the principle that their sin debt is paid. There is nothing more that, that they need to do and they, they fully understand that. Then it empowers us. Then that gospel, this new life, which we'll talk about in just a minute, it empowers us to overcome that sin nature that runs deep within inside us. That's why this is the good news, right? Now, if you fall under that category, say amen. 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 This is great news. Our, we are fully forgiven in Jesus Christ. And keep in mind, Paul is even in this context in Hebrews, talking to this kind of Christian. These were believers. We went through all of this before. These were believers that were struggling, right? They, they had family and friends that wanted to pull them back under Judaism and, and go back under the law. They had been saved. They had received Christ, but they were starting to wonder if they made the wrong decision. And Paul has laid all this groundwork uh, about Jesus Christ to, to just instill in their heart that this is good news. What Christ has done for you by you putting your faith and trust in him is the greatest decision that you can ever possibly make, right? So as we sort of draw that conclusion, I believe what Paul is desiring to show them and then also to show you and I this morning is the blessings and benefits of grace. That's really our first point. All that other was introduction. The blessings and benefits of grace. God not only forgives our sin, but he forgets them as well. Look with me again at verse 17 and 18. He said, And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. What a wonderful what a profound statement, message that this is. When we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. God will not remember our sin. Amen. Now, there are those, rather, uh, those things, those sins, think about this, that, that haunt us, that we want to forget Right, Th those sins that we don't want anybody to know about, right? Those secret things that we have done that we wouldn't want a light shined upon, those actions we wish that we could erase for, for, from what we had done, we wish we could erase them from our memories, that we would engage in those activities. Listen, those are forgiven and remembered no more. These are no longer issues before God. Our slate is wiped clean. Those Old Testament sacrifices, that blood of bulls and goats, as we said, was sort of a covering, if you will. Now our sins are cleansed. Now listen, I know there are some that look at this principle in Scripture, this teaching in Scripture, and, and you know, they'll, they'll get into the argument and say, well, God doesn't really forget our sin, Right? They'll say our sin is forgotten in the sense that, you know, it's just no longer an issue with God. And I would argue at this point, listen, God doesn't think like you and me. You and I have a hard time forgetting things. You and I have a hard time letting things go. We have a hard time understanding this because we have a hard time forgetting ourselves. But God, God is holy. God is just. God thinks very different than you and I think. The reason I believe that God forgets our sin is because when we stand before him, we've said this many times, as a believer, as one washed in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we stand with the righteousness of Christ on our life. 
So what that means then is when we're kind of applying this to this context, our sin debt is paid, we are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, therefore it's by that standing, it's by the righteousness of Christ, it's by the, his shed blood that has washed our sins away that God the Father, he no longer sees or remembers our sins. What does he see? He sees his son, Jesus Christ. Wow, that is remarkable. And we need to latch on to this principle. When you a moment ago prayed, and I hope you prayed with us collectively, God sees Jesus Christ. You are washed clean. Your slate is washed clean. All because of what he has done. So as this is a blessing and a benefit of grace, God not only forgives our sin, he forgets them. Secondly, God changes us. Look at verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I want us to see this morning, the next couple minutes, the full scope of justification and sanctification. All right, we're, I know in context here, we see sanctification mentioned. We'll see how that's to be set apart, right? Uh, declared holy. It's that declared holy here is in this context. It, it, the topic at hand is what? What has Paul been hammering at? The topic at hand here really is, is salvation, right? right? The salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Paul has currently been giving uh, a, a instance after instance and talking about the difference between temporary, repeated animal sacrifices and then that difference then of a single perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, right? We've seen that teaching over and over again. He just got done still speaking about it. Okay, so then in this context, it indicates that this reference is to sanctification as a reference to our salvation from eternal judgment. In other words, we're sanctified, we're declared holy, we don't have to worry about condemnation. We, we are saved, our sin is forgiven, but now we do want to tie in the principle because we're going to see that sanctification that's set apart to then live holy is also here as well. So this is where justification and sanctification just are so closely woven together. And I want to break that down just for a minute. When we receive Christ, right, today maybe you're here, you, there was a time in your life where you realized you were a sinner, you realized what Christ had done for you uh, by living that sinless, perfect life, by, by g shedding his blood, by giving his life on the cross, by dying, by being raised again, having victory over death. And there was a time in your life where you heard the gospel, where someone shared with you the scriptures, and you realized your need of a Savior. When you called upon God and asked him to forgive you of your sin, when you called upon Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, when you said, God, I now want to live for you. God, come into my heart and save me. A couple things happened. This is where these two things are so woven together. First, something happens to us. And what happens to us by God is that we are declared righteous. We're declared innocent by virtue, not of what we have done. Right? It's nothing of what you have done. It's by virtue of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We could say it this way. We are declared not guilty. What did we deserve? Hell. Separation from God for all of eternity. That's what we deserved. In the moment we receive Christ, we're washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Christ is now applied to us. We stand before the Father. He sees his son. He sees the shed blood. And he declares us righteous. He says, you are no longer guilty. That's what happens to us. This is called justification. Second... There's something happens in us, right? Now here, God not only forgives 
our sin, but he also changes us. There's an actual change that occurs from within. When we become a follower of Christ, we are told that sin no longer has power over us. Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. In other words, all through what Jesus Christ has done, you now can have victory over sin in your own life. Before we, came a fo- before we became a follower of Jesus, sin did have a hold on us. Sin did reign supreme in our life. It was more powerful than we were. In Christ, that power was broken. In Christ, those chains were broken. That weight, that debt, the power sin had. Here you go, Brother Jeff, your psalm this morning. That net, that, that bird's net that, kept, that snared our sin around us, that kept that sin tied close to us, that was cut free. And we are freed from that bondage. Consequently, then, we begin to walk in a new direction in that direction of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's sanctification, right? So here's where justification and sanctification work so closely together. So what are those blessings and benefits of grace? Our God forgives and forgets our sin. He then changes us from within. We are declared righteous. We are justified. We are also then sanctified. We're set apart to pursue holiness, to pursue Christ's likeness, which we're going to go into here in just a moment and all of this occurs why because we have been fully forgiven it's all of Jesus Christ secondly this morning we see the blessings and the benefits of grace I think we need to look at the believers response to God's grace What then should be our response to this grace? These graces he has bestowed upon us. Notice, look at verse 14. Verse 14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. There that that word is again. In other words, we could say it this way. We're made perfect. We are being made holy. We are considered holy in God's eyes. But the process, here we go, listen to me. The process of living out that holiness, it is that very thing. It's a process. It takes work. It doesn't happen overnight. We continually work at it, right? We're declared holy. We're declared righteous in God's eyes. That's complete. That's done. But for you and I then to continually pursue holiness, to become more and more like Christ, that's a process that we live out each and every day. We've touched on this already, right? When we become a believer, our relationship with sin, it suddenly changes. That sin no longer has that power uh, to, or, or constraint to control us. When we become then part of God's family, we are freed from that control of that sin nature. That old man, it will take us a while. It'll even take us a lifetime to learn that we do not have to respond to these sinful impulses over and over again. Listen, that doesn't mean we're going to ever get it fully right. There's going to be times we fail. There's going to be times we sin. We're going to go to God and confess, and then we're going to pursue holiness. We're going to pursue Christ-likeness. So the, the use of the term perfected here, don't misunderstand this. It should be taken here in the usual, really biblical context. It's no different. It's a reference to maturity. It's a reference to completion in Christ, right, to growth. This is not a reference to sinlessness. Paul is not saying, listen, now that your sin debt is paid, now that you've been changed, now that that old sin nature no longer has its, its, its bound over you, that then you, you are perfect. You will never sin again. That's not what he is teaching. Paul again is saying through a relationship with Christ, we should grow through a relationship with Christ, through this change in our life, through what Jesus Christ has done, this process of sanctification, it does not include until we get to heaven. 
I'll say it this way. Uh, sanctification is something that begins when we put our trust in Jesus as Savior, and it will really end when we are finally, completely free of that old sinful flesh. We receive that glorified body. We stand before the Lord in heaven. But until then, folks, we ought to be pursuing holiness. We ought to be pursuing Christ's likeness. I want to spend just a moment on this. One author said in this process of this people with this process of sanctification, he says people make progress in sanctification at different rates. Right, I'm going to continue in a moment. But that's pretty simple, isn't it? We understand that. We all grow at different rates. He says, how quickly we progress and how we progress will depend on how well we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in our lives. In other words, you know, when the Holy Spirit convicts us when we listen, when the Holy Spirit instructs us, will we do what he says? When the word of God enlightens us, will we follow after it? He says we must choose to grow in holiness. Our growth will determine the level of joy, peace, and commitment we find in living. Sanctification is practical. Knowing what God teaches us about sanctification, knowing that God has set us apart, he has declared us holy in his presence. We are holy, but he has also set us apart to pursue holiness while we're on this earth. When we know these things, then we should desire to be more like Jesus Christ. I think we should ask ourselves a couple questions. This is where the application begins for today, right through the scripture. That first question ought to be, how am I doing in this area of growth in my life? How am I living out this sanctification in my life? I've been set apart to pursue holiness. I've been set apart to pursue Christ's likeness. How am I doing? And listen, for a moment, you know, I, I have a, a, a preacher's hat on, but I'm also going to put a pastor's hat on here for a minute. And I say this out of love, this process of sanctification, it is a progress that we should be able to track through the course of our lives. You say, what do you mean by that? Listen, you and I should be able to look back over the past year, the past two years, the past five years or so, and we should be able to note some real progress in our Christ-likeness. We should be growing. There's no reason why we can't. There's no reason why we shouldn't, right? This is a command that the Lord gives us. It's an instruction of how he wants us to live. I understand we're still a long way to go, and we're always going to continually be working through this process, but we need to be seeing that we are making progress. You shouldn't be stagnant. Listen, you should not be stagnant in this area of your life. Our values, our habits, our relationships with others, the things that we desire, they should be changing. They should be changing on a yearly basis, a two-year basis, a three-year basis, and definitely, I say even looking out at this five-year plan, we should, we should be able to look five years from now and see substantial change in our life in this area of sanctification. And if we're not, if we're stagnant, if you look back over the course of two or three or four years and you just haven't seen any growth in this area, you need to examine then what is it in your life that is hindering this growth? God wants you to grow. God wants me to grow. God wants me to be more holier today than I was five years ago. And he wants the same for you. God wants me to be more like Christ today than I believe I even was yesterday. Now that's a pretty high goal, but we ought to seek that every day of our life. And again, this is where the pastor hat comes in. In my experience, we can sort of par this down 
and about three groups of people in, in a setting like this, right? In a normal church setting, that that first group is, they just maybe don't have any desire to grow. And they come to church and maybe they're a bit faithful here and there, but there's not a lot of participation, right? There's not a lot of fellowship. And, and they know and you know, they just, you just don't see much growth. There doesn't seem to be a desire to grow. They're saved. They know they're saved. They'll tell you how they've received the gospel. But you could look back a year, two, five, and it's just stagnant. There's a second group where, man, they're growing, but they're struggling. It just seems like they are, they are battling tooth and nail, right? There's, there's family issues. There's some personal issues they're dealing with. They're, they're trying to overcome maybe some sin or just vices in their own life. But let me tell you, they are putting the work in, and it just seems to be a painful, a painful process, but there's progress, and, and, and that progress is being made. And then there's a third group. I think we all would prefer to be in this group, where it just seems that this whole sanctification thing, this whole be holy thing, this whole be like Christ thing, just seems to come simply to them, right? Now, let me tell you something. That last group... Boy, we'd say we want a whole church full of those people, right? We all want to be like that. Those folks didn't get to that place in their life without being in that middle group at one time or another. There was a time where they were struggling. You may not be part of their life where you see it, but let me tell you, there was a time where they were growing, they were maturing, they were putting the work in, and now they matured to a point where it just seems it sort of comes simpler to them more and more as they grow. And I will say this as a pastor, boy, I, I don't, I'm sure you would agree, we don't want to see anybody in that first group. I'd rather have a whole church of that middle group, right, where those people, it's painstaking, man. There are, there are tears. There are hours of time invested. There is counseling that's done. There are phone calls. There are prayers alongside, but those Folks are desiring to grow. So where do you fall? What group are you in? Right? We should be pursuing the sanctification in our life. And if you're stagnant, figure out what's hindering you today. If you're in that middle group, boy, just keep doing exactly what you're doing and, and keep being obedient, keep striving for Christ's likeness, keep striving to do right, and God is doing that work in your life. And boy, if you're in that last group where you matured, then you know what? You help. You help the other two. You come alongside and help the other two. So first question, how am I doing in this area of growth and maturity? And second thing we should ask is what then can I do? What can you do to, to facilitate this process of sanctification in our life? Right, it's an excellent question. I'm not going to leave you hanging. I will say this. This is where Paul now is going to dig into this. The next of the rest of chapter 10 through the rest of the book is a focus on practical application, practical uh, uh, seeking after holiness. However, today, one simple rule. You say, Pastor Fisher, what can I do today to help facilitate this process of sanctification in my life? It's a very simple principle, and it's going to seem even too simple Read the Bible and do what it says. Be obedient. It is that simple. Read the Bible desiring to do what it says and then do it. And then be obedient. It's why we teach that principle to our children at the youngest age possible. Some, for some reason, though, we get to be adults and we just throw that principle out the window. Right? We know it, but it's like, oh, that's too simple for us. I don't know about you. I sometimes have trouble reading the Bible and doing what it says. Do you? Amen? Amen. I had one person tell the truth. How about the rest of you? <laughs> right? We all do. Okay? 
Read the word of God, be in it, and then work to obey. Not because you're trying to impress God, not because you're trying to impress God, not because you're trying to impress someone in church or a friend or a family member, but you're doing it for this reason. You have come to understand that living God's way is the absolute best way to live. You determine God, I'm done doing it on my own. I want to live your way. I want to grow. I want to be holy. God, you set me apart for a purpose. You've done all these things through your son, Jesus Christ, in my life. God, the least I can do is be like your son. Help me, Lord, in that endeavor. Our conclusion, draw two conclusions. These are quick. First, we're reminded That forgiveness, we've said this before, very similar to this. Our forgiveness is not anchored to our goodness, but it's anchored to God's grace. And when we grasp this principle, when we fully absorb it, we understand we cannot earn our salvation. All the good deeds and the, uh, in the world cannot balance out our sin. We find forgiveness through Christ in Christ alone. The wonderful message of the gospel is then that forgiveness, it's available to anyone and to all who will put their faith in and trust in Jesus Christ. And friend, if you are here today and you know your sins have never been forgiven, you're uncertain right now whether you're a child of God, you're uncertain of where you will spend eternity, Christ has done everything, everything to accomplish exactly what you need. Trust him today. Put your faith and trust in him. Let his sacrifice, let his sufficient work on the cross, let his sinless blood cleanse you from all your sin today. And let today be the day that you are declared righteous, that you are declared holy, that you can stand before the God of this universe with the righteousness of Christ in your life as well. And then secondly, believer, this is for us. Our focus, then, we know these truths. They should spur us on. We should be pursuing holiness. We should be growing and maturing, desiring to be more like Christ each and every day. Through him, this power of sin has been broken in our lives. Those chains are gone. The net is released by his grace. As we said, we stand before him forgiven. Our sins are forgotten. We are declared holy. It's by that same grace then by which we also can begin learning how to live, how to live as we've been set apart for a greater purpose. This is a wonderful privilege for God to sanctify us, for God to set us apart, for God to even put us on the path to pursue holiness, to pursue Christ-likeness. This is a privilege And this is a privilege that we then should fully embrace. And I know I'm the preacher. I know I'm the pastor. But this is an area in our life that we should embrace enthusiastically. This isn't a, oh, well, we're saved. Bless God. Let me do my best. This is praise the Lord. I've been forgiven. God, let me live for you better today than I did yesterday. God, I want to be holy in your sight. Help me to be holier today than I was yesterday. And when we consider and we put all of this teaching that Paul has compiled for us, we go back 
to our theme, to our topic today, we then of all people should be the most grateful and thankful and exuberant that through Jesus Christ, we are fully forgiven. Wow, what a blessing that is today. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today. We ought to be a humbled people right now, Lord, as we consider what you have done for us through your son, through his complete work on the cross, through his giving his life and shedding his precious blood for my sin, for the sins of this world. Oh God, those of us that have been declared righteous, Lord, we stand before you with the righteousness of Christ. We're cleansed. Not only are we forgiven, but God, you have forgotten our sins and iniquities. And then, Lord, you have set us apart. You've not only declared us holy, but Lord, you then want us to pursue holiness in our life. You want us to pursue Christ-likeness in our life today. Lord, I pray as we just look to our Savior, the sufficiency that only comes through him in his sacrifice, that, Lord, we would be more enthusiastic than, than we have ever been to live for you, to grow, to mature, to be sanctified. Father, I pray today that if there's one here that has never received Christ, oh, they would make that decision today. Lord, maybe there is one here that has been saved. They understand they're forgiven. That's settled. But Lord, they're just a bit stagnant in their growth. They're a bit stagnant in their pursuit of holiness, their pursuit of Christ-likeness. Oh God, I pray today would be a day where your spirit convicts, but not only convicts, but also encourages us that this is something you have required of us to do, and it's something that you have then equipped us to do as well through your spirit, through your word, through our church family, the fellowship we have with one another. Oh God, help us pursue after this today. Lord, bless our invitation. Do a work in our hearts and our lives like only you can. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, just for a moment, listen. Have you ever been declared righteous? That's what that just justification is all about. Have you ever been set apart? Have you been sanctified? That only happens when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, my friend. And if you're not sure today, oh, would you please settle it? Listen, you can pray to God right now. You can ask him to forgive you of your sin. You can believe in that complete work that Christ has done for you. You can ask for Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior today. Make that decision today. I don't know why anyone would kind of go through this life not knowing their sins have been forgiven and then forgotten by a holy God. In a few moments, we're going to have invitation. You can respond, but don't leave this place without talking to someone. Come and see me. Come out to the picnic. Speak to someone, and we will settle this today together. Maybe you're here, and I believe many of us are believers today. We should have all been challenged through the Holy Spirit, myself included. How are you doing in this pursuit of sanctification? How are you doing in your pursuit of holiness and your pursuit of Christ-likeness? What group did you fall under? Can you track back one, two, five years and see where you've made pretty some substantial growth spiritually in your life? 
If you can't, figure that out today. Determine today to grow. Boy, if you find yourself in that middle group where you're just struggling, listen, we will struggle together, but don't stop. Continue growing. And boy, if you are in that latter group where you matured and it just seems to come a little easier to you, then you come alongside someone. You be a help and a mentor and encouragement. But as a church, let's pursue this Christ-likeness. Let's pursue this holiness together. Let's be more like our Savior each and every day. God spoke in your heart. You can come to this altar in a moment. You can do business right there where you sit, but spend some time with him. Let the Holy Spirit work in your heart, work in your life. Make the changes that need to be changed. Make the altercations that need to be altered. Well, let's do all of this with an excitement, with an enthusiasm that it's not of anything we have done. It's because we are fully forgiven in Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this invitation. Oh, I pray today will be a day that will change someone's life, whether that's for eternity or how they begin to pursue holiness in their own life. Do a work, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jeff, would you come this morning?